And welcome back. Dean Obi Dollar Show. We're live here Thursday, March 20th, 20th. Joining us now, our friend Amisha Cross, Assistant Director at the Education Trust, a Democratic strategist, a contributor to Daily Beast, and on cable news nonstop. So I'm glad we've got you to be here now with us. Now, how, how are you doing, my friend? Pretty good. Busy, like you said. I did get promoted a couple months ago, so I have not corrected you yet. I am now a director and no longer an assistant director at EdTrust. But um, the other work that I do is largely um, media-based uh, policy, politics, and it has been an exciting whirlwind experience. As you know, it's an election year, so every day is a new one. It's going to get busier and busier because we have no idea what's going to happen. I mean, look at tonight, and we'll talk about it in a second. But the huge event they're having here in New York at Radio City Music Hall, and we're going to have more of these things. So I first I want to start with some really good news. Not that tonight's twenty five million dollar record fundraising is not good news. Alabama special election. Maryland lands wins a district that Donald Trump had won, that the Republican had won by seven points just in twenty twenty two. And she made reproductive rights the cornerstone of her campaign. So what's the takeaway and what should Democrats get from this? Um, they should take away the old adage that we heard from the great philosopher Andre 3000. The South got something to say. Um, Alabama is in the deep South. You can't get redder. Um, you can't get more Republican than the great state of Alabama. But when it comes to women's reproductive rights, even Republican women have stood up in multiple cases around the country and said that they do not want the government. They do not want Republican legislators. They do not want um, elected officials deciding when they should have children, when they should be able to get abortions, and what level of access is going to be available to them. And that's what we saw there. We also saw the extension of um, the IVF crisis that Alabama recently mm -hmm. had. Uh, when I, I think that that legislation and that policy pushed people to understand a whole lot more that this is beyond just how you may personally feel about abortion rights and abortion rights access. It also extends to, and Republicans have always done this, they have wanted to extend beyond abortion rights to birth control, to family planning, up to and including IVF. IVF. Um, and now they have just said the quiet part out loud in policy after policy and state after state. And women have stood up and they have showed them that they are not going to take this sitting down, that they are not going to accept this. And this is the one unifying um this is the one unifying part of policy across multiple spectrums, whether you're a Democrat, Republican, red state, blue state, purple state, people want women want a woman's right to choose. They don't want this right wing, arrogant agenda of forcing their religion down someone's throat by a law where you're forcing a woman against her will to carry a fetus to term. This I call the time. This is barbaric. This is literally barbarism to me. The idea because women are dying. Mat maternal mortality rates have gone up in states where there's abortion men. They are women killers and they don't care. So this is really personal. Do you think for Democrats look for I guess in certain districts, there's certain issues to run on. But are you suggesting this transcends all of that, that wherever you're running as a Democrat across the nation, even if you're in a blue state, you got to talk about this issue? Because, look, the Supreme Court this week heard about the medication abortion. And while I think they're going to not rule the way the right wanted, that ruling would affect the blue states just the same. Absolutely. Because and, and to your question, yes, I think that there is there will be messaging changes depending on the state you happen to be in. But the the crux of the argument will be the same. At the end of the day, um, women matter. Women's choices matter. Women's voices matter. There are more women in the electorate today than we've ever seen in our nation's history. And they are showing the Republicans day in and day out in special elections, in general elections, in the midterms. And they will do it again in November. Stay out of our uteruses. Uh, most Republicans can't even tell you the difference between uterus, ovaries, fallopian tubes, and anything else. We right. need to get to a point where family planning is left to the woman and the family. <laughs> um, and the decisions she makes are between her and her God or whomever or whatever she worships. This is not a governmental issue. And it is frustrating to see more and more, um, more and more Republicans try to make women second class citizens and try to, in many efforts, take away the rights that we have fought for so long to have across this country and quite frankly, put our lives in danger. We saw what happened um, in Texas just a few months mm -hmm. ago where that lady had to actually leave to go to another state to be able to get an abortion. Meanwhile, her child was not going to make it. Her, her fetus was already dead yep. inside of her. Um, to, to have carried that and you know not been able to get that abortion, she too would have had some serious detrimental health consequences up to and including not being able to have kids again in her future. And the state of Texas basically ruled they did not care about that. So for a pro-life 
party, as they call themselves, to not care about the life of the mother, to not care about um, fetuses that are in crisis, that will not make it, um, medically will not make it. This is also the party of anti-science and the party of anti-medicine. They believe they know more than that woman's doctors. This is a scary place to be. Yeah, it's a party of oppression that is a religious supremacist party, also a white supremacist party. And this is what we're dealing with. That's MAGA of today. I'm chatting with Amisha Cross. So to change gears, but to talk about an issue we've touched on many times before, and that's diversity, equity, and inclusion. Republicans are now, the level of anger towards this program and labeling everything, anyone who's not white, who's black and visible as DEI, uh, is new. And there was something you had tweeted, it was a great NBC News analysis, that Republican lawmakers now in more than 30 states have introduced or passed more than 100 bills to either restrict or regulate diversity, equity, inclusion initiatives in the current legislative session. What is their end goal? This is their new dog whistle. Their end goal is to take America back. When Donald Trump said make America great again, even though that was odes to Nazism in this country, it's also nodes to an America where you did not have black people in the C-suite. You did not have black people who are presidents of universities. You did not have black people who um, led small businesses. You do not have black home ownership. What they are trying to do is eradicate black progress. And to do that, they have to diminish what they feel is what created access for Black people. They are pointing that all to DEI programs. And at this point, judging by what we recently saw with the um, with the unfortunate uh, in the post accident um, at the, the bridge incident in Baltimore, where their mayor was called a, the DEI mayor, which you know DEI is now being used as a euphemism for the N word. Um, it's a very like maddening place to be. Because it diminishes the efforts of Black people. It diminishes the struggle that we've had to maintain even half of what is deserved. It um, diminishes the fact that to get to the level of being in the highest office in the land, when we're talking about former President Barack Obama, to getting, beginning to make it to vice president, when we're talking about uh, Kamala Harris, um, to make it to any of these heights requires a lot of hard work, a lot of investment, a lot of being more, way more than average. And for black people who have always been told that this nation was not built, we we built it, but it was not built for us. A constitution that counted us as three fifths of a person, a group and a design structure that didn't allow us to participate in the very core of our democracy. When we talk about all the different laws that prevented us from voting in the early days, be it whether it was the poll tax or the literacy taxes or the KKK literally, you know, um, burning up communities and trying to force fear tactics against those who are trying to vote. And now Republicans pushing redistricting efforts across the country. DEI has never been something that eradicated the past or the present when it comes to the struggle that black Americans continue to face, nor is it something that gave black Americans something that was un deserve. And it's very disruptive and frustrating that so many white conservatives, so many conservatives across this country use DEI as a scapegoat to eradicate black success and black progress. Absolutely. And you mentioned Mayor Brandon Scott, the mayor of Baltimore was on Joy Reid's show yesterday. I want to play a little bit of that where she, Joy Reid asked, what is your reaction to these Republicans now calling you a DEI mayor? And here's Brandon Scott, clip number four, please. Tax on you for having the nerve to be black and also a mayor. Well, I think, listen, uh, uh, I know and we all know and you know very well that black men and young black men in particular have been the boogeyman for those who are racist and think that only uh, uh, straight, wealthy white men should have a saying anything. We've been the boogeyman from them since the first day they brought us to this country. And what they mean by DAI, in my opinion, is duly elected incumbent. Uh, We know what they want to say, but they don't have the courage to say the N-word. And the fact that I don't uh, believe in their uh, untruthful and wrong ideology, and I am very proud proud of my heritage and who I am and where I come from, scares them. Amisha, it really seems like the force on the right want to erase black faces from and brown face as well, but specifically black, because that's anti-blackness is so built into to the right and even to the origins of this country, to be blunt. It really seems that you want to erase black achievement. A hundred percent. And I say this <laughs> even um, with organizations that I represent and have worked for. When we say anti-DEI and we talk about it in the framework and context we're in right now, this is not universal. This is not, let's not all oh, people of color this. Let's not, you know, talk about this as in BIPOC. They're talking about black people. 
And the yeah. level of attacks that have been lodged against black people, be it whether it was the former president of Harvard University or, you know, um, us hearing the statements from and seeing the tweets from um, Elon Musk across X, formerly known as Twitter, where he's alluding to black people having smaller brains, mm -hmm. not having the capacity, them being the reason why Boeing planes are falling out of the sky. Um, that is all these things are simply fundamentally untrue. However, we're seeing white supremacists jump onto it. We're also seeing young white Americans jump onto it. You know, they're supposed to be the future, but we're watching them share these things across TikTok and speak out against it as mm -hmm. well, as if DEI has made it harder for them to compete um, in, in, in the job market. And I think that it's very sad and frustrating, especially when I see the attacks on the young mayor of Baltimore. Um, Baltimore is a 60 plus percent black city. It is impossible to be a DEI hire when you're elected, first and foremost. It is also impossible right. to be a DEI hire when the overwhelming majority of your city is also black. Um, they, it would have been more DEI if the person had been a white person in office. I, I think that it's frustrating sitting in a black body and watching what's happening today, because these are things I would have expected during my grandmother's time. These are things I would have seen, read about during Jim Crow. These are not things that I expect in the year of our Lord 2024. And it's very maddening to see that even though black people have stood time and time again to the protection of our democracy, our democracy fails us at every single turn and strips away our very humanity and tells us what we do not deserve. And to watch one of the leading political parties, we only have two major parties in this system and the Republican party has decisively dug their heels in on racism and the most of the most disgusting kind. And now they are passing laws and restrictions to DEI. They're passing anti-CRT laws. They're passing and, and including bans on American history because black history is American history. Mm -hmm. And they are doing this under the guise of what they feel like is protecting the democracy they want, which is one that is not multicultural, which is one that does not represent black voices or one that doesn't even make black people visible. Do you think, in your view, is there a line between this in-your-face effort to, they've ended affirmative action in the Supreme Court for schools, but in this effort to reverse DEI and to erase Black achievement, is there a tie to Donald Trump? Is it just he gave them permission to be the person they've always wanted to be and didn't think they could be? And they're like, oh, we could say this out loud? Because it really seems like a move backwards and Jim Crow sentiment going on now with these people. I think we give Donald Trump way too much credit in that. Um, he definitely amplified the voices, but the voices were already there. And he fed red meat to people who are already hungry. And he also saw where America was going. Because I, I was on another news network earlier today, and we talked about my experience um, as a campaign advisor for former President Obama. And of course, Obama won in 2008. He won again four years later. But there was a huge shift in American politics, policy, and sentiment while he was in office. The coalition he built became extremely fractured halfway through his first administration. And we saw time and time again a rising upset and vitriol that a Black man could have ever ascended to that level of power. And out of that came the Tea Party movement, which was essentially, you know, uh, white citizens council. And then we saw, mm -hmm. um, then we saw, you know, the, the new iterations of things that Matt Gates and others lead um, on the far right, the, the, the rise of the alt-right, in addition to 4chan and all these crazy things and, 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 and white supremacist violence. That is what came out of this, because nothing else explains having two terms of a black president and shifting entirely someplace else. Because uh, I won't even say it's to the right. I don't know where the hell they were going when they elected Trump, but they went somewhere right. to where you supported hatred, to where you supported um, mm. nodes of violence, to where you supported someone who was outly racist against everybody. And that tells me that that was already festering in the American consciousness. There are certain people who believe that post George Floyd, when we were pushing for more equity, um, and when a lot of people took up a lot of programs and a lot of um, private sector organizations took up DEI narratives and it became part of their um, their policies. There was such a swift move within six, seven months of that to go back to the previous world, to ensure that black people were not able to compete, to ensure that black people were not able to get a certain level of access, because there is a large portion of white grievance in this country. And I would argue it's not just Republicans. There are a, there's a large portion of white grievance in this country that would like to blame anything that is not going right for them on black people. And even though black people still have the lowest wealth in this country, 
even though Black people own fewer homes today than they did at the height of the civil rights movement, even though our criminal justice system is still um, overly tilted to abuses of power when it comes to locking up, um, tracking um, all of the interactions that Black people have with police starting at the age of three, because the school to prison pipeline uh, is actually a preschool to prison pipeline. None of these things are talked about to the extent that they should be. However, if you bring it up to the average white person, they act as though there are they have blinders on. None of this is actually happening in a country where we can point to specific policies and specific actions that led to it. And I think that's the most frustrating part of all of this, that the idea is that Black people are leapfrogging and getting so far ahead and that they have somehow created a cheat code to take something away from white people. And that's what they think DEI is, or at least that's what they're telling people DEI is. When in all honesty, <clears throat> white people are still making the most, specifically mm -hmm. white men, still have the highest level of access, still have the majority of the people who hire for various jobs, um, still have the highest level of home ownership, still have the highest wealth values for their families. All, all things considered, the outcomes are still light years stronger for white people, even though they are telling everyone, for some reason, they are the downtrodden population. They want to be victims more than anybody I've ever seen in my life without the actual evidence of victimization. And to that very point, there's data that backs it up and that Trump supporters that I've seen in polls, I've written about it, cited in articles like for CNN, where Trump supporters actually think discrimination against white people is now worse than discrimination against black people. They, and it doesn't matter. You can give them all the data points, even life expectancy, maternal mortality, everything you've mentioned as well. It doesn't matter. That's what they feel. They feel like they're under the gun. And it reminds me of the great book by Heather McGee, uh, Zero Sum Game, where if you see any success of someone that's not white in their view, that that was a success that a white person should have had. And everything has to add up to zero. So it's if it's plus one for black, it's minus one for white people and it adds up to zero sum. That's the idea of the zero sum game. And the, her book was so eye opening through time in America, not just now, like, for example, where court said you have to have public pools that allow black people to swim as well. Well, these towns, then they would put fill the pool with asphalt so no one could swim. Like, nope, we're not going to swim with black people because to them, allowing black people was a loss to white people. So taking control of it by filling the black the pool up with with cement was a bigger victory. Like in St. Louis and other places, you're like, this happened in America. It's still remarkable. I'm still learning about America at my age. Like I still read about like this. Why did not I learn this in school? And they wasn't even CRT. We didn't have CRT bands. They just didn't want to teach us. And now we learn more about our own country every day. Remarkable. Tied with Amisha Cross. So, Amisha, let's shift gears here. A couple, last few minutes here. Um, one is we had a really good discussion before you came on about, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene did file a motion to vacate to remove Speaker Johnson. And she's rumbling that she might actually push forward with that when they return from the break after the holidays, about a little over a week. And AOC was on, on Sunday and CNN saying, we don't want to save him, but maybe there's a deal for something. From your point of view, do you save... Mike Johnson, not out of the goodness of our heart. Is there something in return or do you let them show chaos just a few months from the election and say, this is what you get with the Republicans? I say Jesus saves. That ain't my job. Um, <laughs> don't save them. They don't want to be saved. Um, right. No, it is not Democrats job to bail out Mike Johnson any more than it would have been their job to bail out his predecessor. Republicans were the ones who pushed for the push for this one linchpin vote to be able to basically move towards eradication of whomever their speaker happens to be. And they've got to live with the fact that that was something they wanted. Um, at this point. The asylum has been taken over by the MAGAs and let that thing burn. Because not only have they not been able to get their um, their conference together, this is the chaos conference, the Republican Party, when it comes to congressional leadership, they have also not done anything with the power that they've had. A majority is a majority, no matter how slim it is. They have not mm -hmm. done any work of the American people. All they have done is push for impeachments of anybody and everybody they can think of in the Biden administration, in addition to holding on for dear life policies they know the American people don't want. Whether we're talking about abortion rights, whether we're talking about trying to up in um, the collective bargaining and workers rights, they don't care. And I think that at this point, they've come to the decision that they can have 60 different speakers of the House if they want to come the next election cycle. They may lose the House anyway. There are Republicans who are now resigning. They are planning on not running again. They're stepping down um, because they can't handle the chaos of their own party. Trump's 
everything has, you know, vaporized what the Republican Party was. And now they're a shill in his image. And this is the chaos they've created. It is not up to the Democrats to save them. I await the day where Hakeem Jeffries is Speaker of the House. We're not saving Republicans. They created this ship and they're watching it burn. All we need are two Republicans, according to Dan Goldman's statement yesterday, the congressman, to switch from GOP to vote for Hakeem Jeffries and Hakeem Jeffries is Speaker. Because that's how tight the margin is right now. I'm not really good at math. I thought it was maybe three votes, but Diane Goldman put in a statement. It's only two votes. So I'm going to quote that. It's interesting, though. Clearly, Johnson's feeling the pressure because I saw it today. The House impeached Mayorkas like a month ago. He's finally sending the articles of impeachment to the Senate when they come back. So he is trying to make a deal to save his job. So he's really in peril. And I hope, let them remove him. I will say that many listeners who called earlier said, if there's a deal to be had on allowing a vote on Ukraine aid, that then do that and save Johnson. But it's only going to be a temporary save because yeah. then there's going to be a mass rebellion in the GOP. If he allows Ukraine aid to go forward, it'll be a mass exit. I, I, GO, like in my temporary, I mean that it would be less than a month um, before he yeah. would be right back in the same place again. There is nothing. He is in the same place that McCarthy was in just a few months ago. There is nothing that he's going to be able to give them that is going to save him at this point. Because they honestly want this to be a runaway race for Donald Trump. They want all of Donald Trump's policies to, you know, to, to be enacted. They also don't have the votes to get any of those things done because their margins are too slim, but because they refuse to do math, and this is easy math, um, <laughs> they they keep finding themselves in the exact same position. It's it's remarkable. I'm chatting with our friend Amisha Cross. So uh, Amisha, tonight in New York, not far from Sirius XM Studios, President Biden, President Obama, who you used to work for, and President Clinton are together. Radio City Music Hall, it's sold out officially, over 5,000 people. Top ticket, $500,000, down to a few hundred dollars. They're going to raise a record $25 million. And for context, in the month of February, Donald Trump raised $20 million the entire month. So how important is this? As much as I hate big money in politics, it is an indicator of something. What, what do you take away from this big event? that you have the holy trinity of democratic politics in the same place at the same time. You're talking about two of the most famous democratic um, presidents to have ever lived in Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. They are able to bring in dollars. They also have what Lizzo out there. They've got several <laughs> other yep. celebrities out there, Minnie Kaling. Um, and I forget that. I think it's Stephen Colbert is like moderating. He's going to host it. Yep. Mm -hmm. They brought in everybody and their mama. This is huge. And it's huge because the money is needed. We all talk about, you know, big money in politics. It is what it is. This is a national election and it is too close for comfort if we're to believe any of the polls. What we do know is that the battleground states matter. And Georgia has very slim margins. Michigan has very slim margins. Joe Biden cannot afford to lose any of those battleground states. But in particular, we do know that he's got to bolster up his on the ground efforts in, in places like Michigan, in places like Georgia. He's got to have boots on the ground. He's got to have policy directors who know what they're doing and can speak to the moment. He also has to be able to take his D.C. work to the people whether it's talking about the infrastructure jobs that were created across multiple states, whether it's talking about um, housing and development that has been created in, ver in various areas to make housing more affordable, because we know that's one of the huge constraints on the American economy when it comes to your personal income. When we're talking about, you know, fighting for women's reproductive rights or uh, lowering the cost of prescription drugs like insulin, which millions of Americans depend on for survival every day, we have to make sure that where the rubber meets the road so is Joe Biden and Joe Biden's messaging. That takes money. It does. And the get out the vote effort in these tight states is so needed to make sure. What do you make? Uh, last thing here, because the media still loves Trump, but there's something amiss. He can't get the same number of people coming out to his events. But more importantly, he doesn't have the same number of small dollar donors. And he's not raising the money like he did in 2020 or 2016. What do you think is going on? Well, to be fair, there are a lot of people who were waiting for somebody who wasn't Donald Trump to emerge. And every time somebody tried, mm -hmm. it was whack-a-mole and they kind of disappeared. Um, the, the other thing is the big dollar donations, they were pushing that to other people. So when you had those packs, those packs went to folks like Ron DeSantis. Then they moved from Ron DeSantis to Tim Scott. Then they moved from Tim Scott to Nikki Haley. The road is gone. There's nobody else but Donald Trump left. So at this point, um, he's tried to grift so much off of people, whether it was for his build the wall um, conversation or for his multiple court 
court proceedings and trials. He's 91 felony charges in. He's selling, uh, he's selling sneakers out here. He's out here selling playing cards on top of Bibles for $60. The man is looking like a real hustler. He is like the guy, right. and I don't know, you know, I, I'm from the South Side of Chicago. There would, there would always be somebody on a street corner who was selling all manner of perfumes, body lotions, socks, you name it. That's Donald Trump right now. <laughs> and I have never seen, and I hope to never see that in a former president again, but nobody's going to donate to that because they don't trust where the money is going. And right now, if you donate to Donald Trump, it's not going to his campaign. It's going to his legal fees. And that's a great point. Yeah, Donald Trump is like the guy on the corner with the trunk. I opens up the trunk. What do you need? I got sneakers. There are slight knockoffs. One side doesn't match the other. There's something slightly wrong askew. He's got watches, the whole thing. Uh, it's remarkable. Well, Amisha, thanks so much for being on. I, I appreciate it. It's always great chatting with you. And if people want to follow you on social media, where's the best place to go? You can follow me on all things social at, at Amisha Cross. And I'm so happy to be here with you, Dean. Thank you, my friend. Have a great day. Have a great weekend.